Welcome back to Fitness or Fiction. Today we're interviewing our good friend Kaylee Bennett. She's been a trainer, a coach, a manager, and a super mom for how long? Forever. <laughs> Cue the intro. Now, Kaylee, I hear that you have been a mom forever, uh, whatever that means, based on our introduction. Um, how long have you actually been a coach, though? <laughs> I haven't been a mom forever. Um, but I've been a coach since 2006, so 17 years, if my math's right. Okay, so why did you become a coach? Oh, wow, that's a big question. I didn't always want to be one. Um, I would say I originally uh, left high school and started the route to becoming a psychologist. So that was where I originated from because I didn't do active things. I failed gym class and hated sports. So that's where I started. And then somewhere along the way in my first year of psych, I realized that I didn't want to listen to people talk about their problems all day um, and that I could find a better way to help people. Um, and so I just decided to switch into kinesiology, which my family thought was really weird. Um, but so I made that why, jump. Why kines? How did that happen? Like I was actually dating someone whose sister was in the program and I thought what she was like bringing home from university super interesting. So it made me start thinking about it. And then I um, started working out with those two at the YMCA in Crowfoot and then kind of started understanding what it feels like to exercise properly and enjoy it and then realized that that can probably have a greater impact on mental health overall than me only being a psychologist because like part of being a trainer is also listening to problems. Yeah, that's what day. I was going to say. I was going to be like, there's an irony in that that you tried to get away. But you away. also get to like impact other things on a broader scale and but also on a more specific scale so there was a uh, documentary on netflix called stuts and it was about a um psychologist of a celebrity but one of his big things was that he would not take on patients unless they were exercising and it's funny when you talk about not like not wanting to listen to people's problems it's like when they exercise with us and vent out their problems they're in the best like chemical state mm -hmm. to actually get over and start feeling better and move on with things it's like the book spark it's like you don't even have like you don't even have the baseline <laughs> like neurotransmitters in your brain available to start combating depression or anxiety unless you're like moving to get those mm -hmm. so you know you can do everything you want in a psychologist office but unless you're actually moving i don't think it's gonna have lasting impact i talk trash about that often it's funny i actually tell my wife diane that it's almost cheating what i do because She's like, oh, all of, our, all of your clients love you. I'm sure all of your clients love you. And over there, maybe that one. I don't know that one. But <laughs> when all of our clients love us, I'm like, yeah, it's easy for them to love us because we set them up in that chemical state to love us. Like as soon as they come, they might come in after a hard day, but they always leave feeling better, happier, healthier. Da, 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 da. Yeah, I like to aim. bring them back down again. You too. like to just knock them down. Yeah, you're feeling you're great. You're a piece of garbage. Yeah, well, you suck at this. Do that. It's so hard. See no. these? <laughs> you... <laughs> I don't do that. It's only a joke. But yes, that's where I got started. It's, and that's how I got started in kinesiology. And then um, I actually got a job um, halfway through my kines degree at World Health Club in Calgary. And that's when I started as a personal trainer. And then I just never left. It was very weird to graduate university and be like, I don't have a different job. What changed? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. So how did you get involved in your own fitness journey? We're kind of tandeming this thing. We're going to talk about you and, and your coaching experience. And we're also going to talk about you and your own um, health experience. Because part of this, this interview series that we're doing is we've talked a lot about different topics and weighed in on them and whatever. So now we're, we're actually wanting to just see the reality that people deal with. So how did fitness first hit your radar as a person that wasn't really into sports and didn't, didn't really identify with that as like a, a primary driver? The first memory I have of fitness was in grade six when we had to do like a fitness test in gym class and I couldn't do a sit up. So I like failed the class and then I remember going home. Don't laugh. It's, so it's just, it just seems, mean. it <laughs> seems so old school to be like, Hey, you're a grade six kid. You fail. Like well, I failed that portion because I couldn't do a sit up and you were supposed to do 
X amount. Yeah. Um, and then, and so I remember like going home and my mom had like a old treadmill in her, in her room. So I started practicing like sit-ups and, and doing some like stuff on the treadmill and that's about it. And then I remember going into grade seven and then that's when cross country started. And my God, it took me like 35 minutes to run two and a half K. Like I was the last one all the time. Like I failed that too. What kept you trying? You, your, your initial... I didn't keep trying. Once okay, I okay. didn't have to do phys ed in grade 10, I was like, out. Game I'm over. out. I'm not doing phys ed. But then I started back in it, like I said, when I got the gym membership to the YMCA, and then I started going there and all like really just um, buying fitness magazines and doing the workouts in those was where I started, which I feel like is where a lot of people... What sparked start. you to actually want to go to the YMCA, though? In my experience, the reason why I ask, and I might be picking at you, but a lot of people are sparked by insecurities. It was for me. It was because the guy I was dating went. So I feel like it was just like a way for me to like spend time with him. Okay. So I was like, well, I'll go. And then that like, so like the friends I had, I was working at the co-op gas bar. And so all those guys were, went to the YMCA. And so I thought I would do that and then my sister and I got a membership there and then we just kind of had it as our thing and we would go to it a couple days a week and generally like run on the treadmill or do some of those programs um obviously insecurity like as always I was not like a fit slim kid I I danced competitively till I was 12 um and then quit because I was the chubby one that got put in the back of photos um, <laughs> and then I did swimming. I completed all my swimming levels and, and so I did that, but that kind of all stopped around like that time when like girls hit puberty and start hating how they look because you get like chubby and start bleeding and have like ugly ass new boobs. So like what girl wants to like be in a dance leotard or have to go swimming in that context. So it's really hard. I think as girls to like, you know, get into, like, feel confident in that space, especially at that age. Mm -hmm. um, especially back, like, I feel like it's better now because we have more opportunities for girls and it's not, it's not so much of, like, a, a th like, taboo thing to talk about. But, like, back when it, like, when I was there, like, people still made fun of you for having your period. So it's like, how do yeah. you, like, how do you go? You still do, don't so you? There's been, like, four things that you've mentioned that are so tough. This is, like, the Kaylee Bennett story, a story of perseverance. So, so like, you're, you're like, yeah, I did this. I didn't like it. I did this. It was tough. I did this. I hated. I did this. I failed at it. Then there was bleeding and all this crazy crap <laughs> happening. And, and then I became a trainer and I've been very successful. I, uh, I was a trainer, then a manager, and then a regional director. And now I run a successful online business. How, like, uh, how did that happen? Was that literally just kind of, well, Kenise seems okay and you, you started going that road or, or yep. what happened? I like, I wasn't enjoying the psych I was doing. Um, <clears throat> and then I started thinking of like more of what I wanted to do. And I really liked being at the Y. And like I said, I really, I talked with my then boyfriend's sister a lot of, and like got to see like her courses and her labs. And like the first couple of years of Kenise is pretty interesting when you actually get to do some of the exercise phys stuff. And so I found that like, I was always interested in science. Like I'm a really good student. So seeing that side of science seemed super interesting to me. Um, and then I got into Kenise and I had a really like awesome experience. I did my first two years at Mount Royal. Um, and so it was like small classes and really like, it was just awesome. So as I started doing that more, um, one of the first like courses you take in Kinesis is like an exercise testing one. So they had us like run through a gamut of tests on ourselves at the beginning of the semester. And then we had to create a program for ourselves for those three months and go through it. And then we had to test ourselves again. And so like that, I think really opened my eyes to like what you can do with fitness. And, and so I really enjoyed that course and still remember that and remember like, uh, writing myself programs and going to the Mount Royal gym every day to like work on specific things. Um, at that time I started doing some like boxing style stuff too because I really liked the Rocky movies and those like training scenes so I was like I'm gonna do that and then and um, I also like always wanted to be able to run so I did some running like here and there and kind of like that but um, and then so I was like quite active and normal. I moved to Mexico for a year. I ate tacos and got chubby. Didn't do much. There's no gyms there. It's like really hard to like imagine being in a world where it's not like accessible to have. They had one gold gym in like all 
of Puerto Vallarta. And it was like, there was no AC and it was a piece of crap. And it was like, I'm not taking a half an hour Mexican bus ride to pay $50 a month to go to like a gym with no AC. So when I came back to Canada, I really missed the gym and working out. Got back into the university, started working at World Health, started getting to know more people. I hired a trainer almost right away. I trained with Manchester. Oh, Adam right Miller. Away. There we yeah. go. Um, Curtis used to throw Swiss balls at my head during my training <laughs> sessions with him. That sounds, sounds super like helpful. It. Sounds two, accurate. Yeah. And then Who I went that? to your abs like class guy. and you made fun of me for having SWAS. The yeah. first class I went yeah. to. With you. Curtis just like, really sounds like a bully on this episode. <laughs> he's my trainer now where's, where's the- so i just want to say too like the, the part like the reason why we're doing these interviews i think um like your fans your clients your loved ones might want to learn something deeper about you or learn about your experiences i think a big part of it is people not feeling alone in this journey i know countless people who are insecure with going to the gym oh people are going to look at me and things like that so for you when you first started going to the gym whether it's the ymca or world health what was that experience like for you? Did you find it nerve wracking? Are you very comfortable right off the get go? Like, how did things feel? I'm still not comfortable. 100% still not comfortable. going to the gym. Kaylee Bennett, a story of perseverance. <laughs> <laughs> I like. I mean, even most recently, we are like. Every, I think everyone. Well, gyms were closed, and then in the in the COVID times, I had a baby, and then when the gyms reopened, there's no childcare, so I was essentially, like, working out by myself in my basement for two years, which, like, took me a while to get in the swing of, but then it started becoming a habit, and when Evolve opened and I started coming here, I was like, I have severe anxiety about working out in the gym in front yeah. of other people. And you've again. been a coach for 15 yeah, plus so years me, in the I gym I just atmosphere. did it. I was like, I'll get over it. I just got to do it, because yeah. nothing's so, going to happen unless I do. This is a huge strength of yours. Like, how long have we been training now? Since what? Oh, oh, oh nine. Oh, nine. Yeah, yeah, okay. So a couple of years. Um, <laughs> I remember you being in the gym and I would harass you to get you to have a good time because you seemed uncomfortable. Like you did, it's like you seem painfully shy. No, (laughs) like you did seem uncomfortable and the more I'd make you laugh, the more you seemed to do things. But I remember like, even when we started, you were like, oh, I have, I have pain. Was it knee pain you were dealing with at the time? You were trying to run and you had some, you had pain that we were trying to resolve and we did. I'm trying to remember how we even like got started training because it was when you moved back from Edmonton. That's right. <clears throat> but like I said, I've always had a trainer. I had Manchester. I had Mark Eddy. I had Josh Stride. Mm-hmm. Like, and then, and then I started working. That was when I was working at Edgemont in the restaurant. And then I went and started working at McLeod. And I didn't have a trainer when I was at McLeod. But you came back from Edmonton. And for some reason, and I still, I can't pinpoint why I asked you to help me with Olympic lifting. Well, at first it was like, it was a knee pain issue from running. I remember that. And it was, we were at Sunridge, but plantar the reason I- Plantar fasciitis. Oh, it was plantar fasciitis. Yes. There it was. Okay. Yep. So, but like when we were doing an assessment, I was kind of seeing where you were at with things. And I, I identified really quickly that like you had developed some sort of engine, uh, like you, you could run, you were doing reasonable distances and things like that. And you were- developing pain and whatever else. And so I I was trying to get to the bottom of it. You had amazing ranges as I did the assessment. And then when I started checking on like strength levels, uh, that's the classic story that you always tell. Curtis tells this to everybody. He (laughs) refers to you sometimes as a wet noodle or a slippery banana peel. Yes. No, there's no wet noodle. There's no slippery. It's always the strength of a banana peel. (laughs) I, I told her that she had the strength of a banana peel because I was shocked. And also she's really good at laughing at herself and we, whatever. But I remember like I put the bar on your back to be like, okay, can you, can you do a back squat? Cause you had been in the gym and whatever. And it crushed you. You were like, I can't stand up. And you were able to front squat it. And I was like, man, okay. So the work you've been doing is good, but like we need to establish some sort of level of performance out of these joints. Because if you with both legs can't stand up with 45 pounds, you imagine how hard it is on your system, carrying your weight on one leg and whatever. But all of that to tell the story that you're a unique client because like even today you're not super comfortable in the gym you don't look at sports and be like super fun that's not like what you would see with the traditional trainer they're like oh yeah i love sports blah 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 i get panic attacks when i think about having to play a sport but like you you've had like these you look at things a different way where you're like yeah this is a huge challenge for me but you see value and like what keeps you going is the question like, I mean, 
I feel like a lot of like what keeps most people going is like a vanity part because I'm like well I love food so if I don't work out then I'll just be like a fat mess so because I'm not going to stop eating um so there's like always that portion but ultimately like I just understand myself enough to know that I feel worse if I don't work out like my mental health takes a dive I actually like got myself off of um antidepressants by incorporating like regular running as my like way to do it so like there's no coach that'll make me stop running no matter how much they want me to strength train it'll just always be something I have to do twice a week because it like gives me space to medicine yeah um so I think like the biggest thing is just how it makes me feel regardless of how hard it is to get in I mean and then there's still times like you struggle there's like even right now I'm having a hard time being like how do I fit a workout in a day I'm you know lots of other things can come up but you like do things to make it happen and then generally feel good after the fact right yeah how's your mental mental chatter or mental health in regards to because I've been there I know Curtis has been there so with you same thing like you had peaks where you're at your prime prime fitness and then you've had slumps and peaks and slumps and things are ever changing like how does your mental chatter help you not beat yourself up too much because I think a lot of people do I beat myself up all the time and honestly um that's like my biggest challenge is that I'm my own worst critic and like um I think a lot of people resonate with Curtis that. told me my weakest muscle is my brain and one of my other coaches told me that I need to get out of my own way so it's not something I'm great at <laughs> um I work on it I think honestly being having to not having to choosing to get pregnant and twice and go through that experience like you like what can you do you can't maintain a certain physique you can't maintain um, a certain level of performance um, no matter what and I feel like when you work in fitness a lot of times like your entire identity gets wrapped up in like whether it's how you look or what type or what workouts you do or how you execute your workouts or what your performance is on those workouts or and then you get pregnant and you're like literally I can't yeah. keep up with any of that and then you also spend your entire life trying to be a certain weight and a certain leanness and a and ha- have a certain look and you're like well I just got to get huge for nine months and it's an unfortunate be okay part with it right yeah the industry just being as vain as it is and people are like oh your your body is your business card like oh I wouldn't hire you you're too skinny or you're not in the shape that I want to be you're not as lean as I want right so kind of having that constantly looming over our heads mm-hmm. we all can't have Curtis's biceps and I've talked to Curtis, well, Curtis knows like where I struggle with that on. And there's been times where I've had to like let go of clients because like their mental chatter is so horrible that it starts impacting me. So those are people I definitely like um, know that I can't train because like I can't put my own mental health at risk for yeah. that. Um, but I, with my first pregnancy, I was like, I think I really, really focused on it. Um, almost to the point that I had a hard time enjoying that pregnancy because I was like so concerned about like, you know, uh, gaining weight or what it was going to like, how I couldn't do things and how, you know, once I had the baby, it was like, you know, I remember our, like our first session back after Asher, I just like, you know, you're so uncomfortable in the gym. You're still wearing maternity clothes. You like, you're squishy everywhere. And you're just like, this is not how I want to be in this space. Um, And then I went into my second pregnancy, like really trying hard not to allow that to be like the space my head can get to. Um, I think I did better. It was still like a struggle, but I was able to like maintain um, my workouts better throughout my second pregnancy because I was just focused on what I could do instead of what I should have done or did before. Um, And then... I think I was a little bit more gracious with myself after that pregnancy too, especially because after that one, I didn't even have access to a gym. It was like, there's no gym. They're closed. I'm in my basement. What can I do? Yeah. So. The Kaylee Bennett story, <laughs> a story of perseverance. <laughs> no, do you? It, go ahead. It's really, it's interesting to me hearing you tell the stories because like some of it, it, it like you seem to have this natural ability to work through challenge and like even like the comment of like, well, your weakest muscle here is your brain. That was specifically like apply your resilience that you already have to your exercise. And like when you started learning how to push, holy smokes, like we went from like I can't back squat the bar to like deadlifting almost 300 pounds. Haven't hit it yet, but. Um, Soon. And I, and yeah. And I remember like coming back from kids or training you through kids. Your second pregnancy, you didn't grind near as much, but it seemed to go better 
because you almost understood the cost of it, which is something that's, that's very, that should be extremely revered, what women give up to have a, a baby. And like, of course, they have like amazing things on the other end, but it does take a toll on your body. There's a lot of stuff that your body has to adapt to that once you're postpartum, you're just postpartum. Like, uh, you'll see um, Galbraith always talking about like, oh, is, your wife had a baby 20 years ago? He's like, yeah, she's not postpartum anymore. It's like, oh, mistake, fact, she is. There's, there's things that change. Um, it's an amazing scenario, but just hearing you talk through this stuff, it, it comes back to the same theme often like you you see something you decide you're going to confront it anyway and then you come out the other end and that's that's how our training process has been through both pregnancies through getting you to understand how strength work can impact your running and I never asked you to quit which is I think why you stayed Uh, but um, yeah it's it's an interesting story that I think a lot of people can kind of relate to it's it's there's a lot of resiliency in this story well thank you I had a weird question about COVID times and working out from home because you worked out at home a lot and then back to the gym and stuff like that. I've talked to a couple guys, Merck, Murkowski being one of them. He was on our last episode, but we were talking about, he was mentioning how I work exclusively from my home gym now. So there's no audience. There's nobody to put on a show for. It's all, it's all hundred percent me. Have you noticed a difference between like working out at home and trying to push through hard workouts. I think we and you actually talked about it during COVID time. Even it's a struggle for me. Like it's not really the same versus when you're at the gym. I don't know. Murkowski, even myself, feel like we're on stage a little bit more. Like you're in the fishbowl and people are watching. So you can push a little bit harder. Do you find anything like that with your experience between home and gym? I feel like like the output level can change definitely because I feel like for me, though, my home gym was kind of limited. Like yours, you have a lot of stuff in yours so like what I had was like a bench and some dumbbells Mm. and a chin-up bar yeah which was in like a different level of my house so it didn't really work well but um so like I could load up quite heavy but like the output was different than say like being able to deadlift with the bar so I feel like that I never really like a I am not like Mr. Ninja so I hate going to the gym and having people look at me so I don't put on a show because I don't like that Mm -hmm. um so I don't I just think it was like it was cool to be in an atmosphere and it was cool to be able to like um do more variety of exercises to have like a better output in my fitness it got really boring doing dumbbells because like how much can you make variety with that it's like you can to an extent you can change up your reps and your sets and your tempo and your rest and like you know some of the ways you put together a program but then there's also the thing that's like sometimes it sucks like getting really sweaty and awful feeling in like a 10 by 10 basement room it's like there's something about being in a gym when you're like i have space to like breathe i think the environment is a big difference too right when you're at home there's so many distractions you can get Mm -hmm. caught up in some and oh maybe i'll just do this instead was when you walk through the doors of the gym there's only essentially one thing to get done yep exactly so that environment helps a lot so we've covered how you got started in the gym and as a coach and and as a as a, we'll call it, exerciser, or or even client, we could call it. But when we get through that process, you've talked about kind of how there's the ups and downs of being pregnant. You've talked about what it's like to deal with people in the gym. We've talked about a lot of stuff like that. But to kind of wrap it up, we've got these these angles of, you know, being a coach and being a client makes you kind of interesting because you've got both sides. We have two main questions. I'll ask the first one. And, and the first one is our, our podcast is called Fitness, Fitness or Fiction, Fiction. right? Um, so it's kind of one of these things. What as a exerciser and as a coach, you can be separate or the same, has been something that you found that is absolute hogwash. It's just fiction. Like people talk about it. They think it's important. And it's something that you, you went when you first got to the gym, people were saying, oh, you got to do this. You need to do this this way or whatever that you found. It's just like, man, that's overhyped. It's, it's not super helpful and needs to be left behind. Have I'm you found on, anything like that? I'm just on a detox tea. I'm just cleansing myself. Just cleansing of all the toxins. Get just, those I mean, BCAs. I feel like it goes in waves and like phases. Like when I started training, it was still when you would like, oh, let's train stability by standing on a BOSU ball. Like, you know, I think back to the programs I wrote like in 2006 and I was like, why why would people hire me? Like, what was I doing? Right. But everyone learns. Um, 
Three I, examples. Give me three. One, okay, a big one is I think there was, and kind of still is, especially in like the strength community, um, that doing cardio kills your strength gains. And I think that that's uh, false because like cardio is like you absolutely 100% need it for your life. So like whether you get like strong as F, um, doing strength things, it, like you still need, you still want to live long enough to realize that. And the, like doing that comes from training your heart and your lungs and your cardiovascular and your pulmonary system. And like, so you don't have to be a runner, but you should absolutely um, push your cardiovascular system to a level of intensity that feels uncomfortable on a regular and semi-consistent basis. Um, I, if you're training a well-rounded strength program and addressing things properly, um, doing a run is not going to make you not gain muscle. Like the strongest I've ever been was like, I had the best 10 K time I had and the highest back squat. So I don't really believe that that could, you know, you could never train. Like if you're training for a marathon, then you train for a marathon, but that doesn't mean you forget about the fact that like, you need muscle in order to do so. If you're training for powerlifting, then you train for powerlifting, but that doesn't mean you forget the fact that like your heart still needs to pump blood to those muscles. So you might want to address that at some point mm -hmm. in time. So I think so, that's a big one. So the idea that strength and cardiovascular fitness Separate. are not mutually exclusive. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think too many, especially, I think it's, especially now with like Instagram fads and stuff, people tend to jump on the bandwagon train of like what seems to be a really cool exercise. Um, but generally speaking, you can, I mean, and every like, you know, the, the big, uh, like not the big fitness influencers, but like the John Goodman and like the Jordan Syed and like those guys have like big followings, but aren't flashy. will always like preach that like the people that get results do like boring shit over and over and over again, because like you just got to keep coming down to that. Like no one's sitting on there doing random Instagram workouts of like these crazy exercises all the time and getting the results. They generally do like this basics and they do the basics well. And that's important too. Well, I like that you said like social media is not all bad. There's some guys that are saying some really good stuff out there, but I've, I see stuff every day that I look at and I'm like, man, that is so misleading. Like I saw the other day people doing push-ups and then touching one foot and going back out and doing a push-up and it was entitled end back pain. Huh? I wish that those tricks worked. <laughs> when somebody's like, yo, you want big chest? Just when you do your cable flies, turn your pinkies in. It's going to be a game changer. And then your chest grows like four more inches. Just four extra inches. I wish. Oh my goodness. You'd, you'd have to bridle those tops. But imagine if those hacks worked. You would need an over-the-shoulder boulder holder. <laughs> Um, and then I think that just because you know how to work out doesn't mean you know how to train someone to. That would be a really big one. There's a, there's, I mean, I've been, I've been a manager in the fitness industry for long enough to know that like, there's a plenty of people that apply to be personal trainers because they're like, well, I've worked out for a trainer for years and I've worked out for years and I know how to do it. And it's like, you know how to train you, but not every client's going to be you. So how does that that used to drive me crazy. I used to ball, like bust balls in my gym all the time when I was fitness manager, walking the floor around prime time. I would see guys who I was friends with. I was friendly with pretty much everybody. But if there's a group of three guys who are training, one of them's phenomenal shape. He knows what he's doing. He's in great shape, great technique. And then his friends are like little newer, little rookies to the gym, and they're lifting way too heavy with terrible form. And then I go to the like, guy in shape like, bro, like Curtis. I'm like, why are you going to let your boys lift like that? Like, what are you doing? You're sitting here on your phone on Instagram. Your buddy's going to break his back, and then there's the end of your workout partner. So, like, to that point, just because you're in great shape doesn't mean it translates. I'm going to push you on that before I let Eric ask his question. Okay. What are the things that you think are missing for the people that, you know, maybe they've had a trainer, they've got some good experience, they've trained themselves to a certain level. What are some of the things that a good trainer or coach has that they're missing? This is a why question. This is like a three-year-old why. Um, <laughs> because <laughs> um, I think sometimes to like understand the like complexities of individual humans, you have to like go back to the simplicities of like you know like do you know how a muscle contracts or like the biomechanics behind a movement, um, because that's really gonna like help you create something for that specific person. Um, and I think it just comes down to someone could have all the certifications and all the education and all the degree in the world, but they might be a horrible 
trainer. So it ultimately does come down to experience, but also with like the openness to learn and like build on it and ask questions and, and recognize that they don't know everything. I think the sometimes the worst trainers or the ones that people should run from are the ones that don't, that refuse to learn from other people. So it's just yeah. learning. I think overconfidence is a scary thing. You need to find somebody that's open to learn. I think that's huge. I think they underestimate the amount of give a crap they have to have about other people because I don't care about how much you like sports. I care about how much you can meet somebody where they're at, which requires behavior change psychology. It requires empathy. It requires all of these things. And then even if you know all the cues to teach a squat, which one's appropriate at the right time? Because you only really have one at a time. So how are you going to get the end point and what steps are you specifically going to take? How exactly is that exercise selection the best? Why does your program look like this right now? How are you going to coach them on what to eat? It's not just knowing the answer. It's like there's all these steps. So I, I think that's a really good, a really good point in, yeah. in that mix. Understanding the complexities too so that you can like understand what to do to make it simple for someone. I know we talked about that like with, at World Health when you teach Olympic weightlifting and it's like well why would I take an Olympic lifting course if I don't train I don't coach clients in Olympic lifting it's like well why wouldn't you want to understand like the most complex way to do an exercise so that the simple ways are easier to explain like that makes sense to me right so yeah I think people oversimplify the body which is a very complex system it's very easy to oversimplify it especially in the world of TikTok when it's 30 second blips of everything in regards to high level trainers be you can be the smartest person in the room but if you have zero people skills they're not going to listen to you they're going to listen to somebody that they vibe with a little bit more maybe not quite as intelligent and you would have all the answers but it's going to leave you being the person sitting on the sideline being like oh, what, why wouldn't they listen to what they're listening to that person that's so stupid I've seen that from very high level elite trainers who have multiple certifications complaining because they can't get any clients while someone less educated than them is flowing with clients just because they can create a better community they're just better people people and they're coachable and willing to learn and they're coachable willing to learn not egotistical all those those things so on the flip side of this question of the most overhyped things you know what's some of the most simple information that would be valuable for any listener like the most effective information would be um number one no one knows exactly what they're doing in a gym, so hire a coach. Even if you think you know what you're doing, you don't, because even like the best coaches have coaches, so that's a moot argument. Um, number two, well, if you and sorry to interrupt, but the best athletes have multiple coaches. Well, yes, you can't say like I can't learn anything new. It's like, well, try me. I'll take you through a session and teach you something new. It doesn't mean you have to hire me, but don't say you'll never learn something new. Mm -hmm. um, number two would be if you actually want. Um, success in terms of like body comp and nutrition you have to record what you eat so like anyone that says like you don't have to you can get to a certain point but you generally just have to get over that annoying hump of the fact that you probably need to track your food in order to get results so stop complaining about it and just do it there's good research on that too people yeah. think that that'll that'll push you down a road that's not good as far as your relationship with food or whatever but the research on people that track isn't that they have a worse relationship with food it's actually quite to the opposite and there's been a few meta-analysis that talk about how it can actually be something that improves that situation so i found that for myself and i also can recognize when it's starting to become like an obsessive thing so i take a step back and yeah. don't record all the time um but i find that it can give you like some general freedom in your food and your food choices to like know that you're properly fueling your body and not having to make it a guesswork situation um and then the last one would be to i mean the the best program is one that you enjoy doing so if you if you are hating how you're exercising or you're not enjoying your program then then find some way to change it because you know, it, you could have like the best, most scientifically sound program and you absolutely hate doing it. Like it's not going to get your results because you're going to hate going. So like. That's actually something I ask a lot of my clients frequently when I build their programs. Because I'll ask them, you know, like what's one or two exercises that you just, you just freaking love that you want to do so bad. And I'll make sure that I pop it in the program for you. So I'm going to sprinkle a lot of things in there that you need, but I'm going to give you some of what you want as well. I tell Curtis regularly when I don't like a program, be like, I won't do that please change this yeah she's really she's really nice she's like hey can you please change this 
I'm having a hard time with. And she's like, I won't do that. <laughs> she's like, That's when you know that you've really messed up. Like on the, on the mess around and find out scale, you know that you're approaching like an eight or a nine. Curtis she's, just knows I, I have like workout ADD. So he needs to like make it change directions regularly in the workouts so that I stay entertained. Well, it's such an interesting thing about the coaching process though, is that like dealing with each different person where they're at, if you can't adapt to them well enough, they would talk with their feet and they have to. Like you can't invest the amount of uh, time and money that it takes to have a coach if, you, if it's not something you're going to do. It just doesn't make any sense. But when you can find this kind of mixture of like, well, this is, this is going to work. This is good stuff. There's a good backbone to it. And then you just throw in that little bit of pepper or paprika to make it something that they enjoy. That's kind of nirvana. Like five minutes of active hangs. That sounds like a good time to me. <coughs> That was yesterday. She, she was not having a great time. I tried to negotiate to three, but... But she's not a lawyer, and she also left the field of psychology, so she is... In she's fact, no longer a, a psycho. psycho. Sometimes I just like <laughs> complaining. I always do what you tell me to. I just enjoy complaining. I wouldn't say I'm the always, only but I would say away vastly from. in the majority. I would say that. You're, you're a fantastic client and a, a fantastic coach. I've watched you have... Uh, really big impacts on people's lives for ages, which is very exciting. And to be part of that, like as in the background, the guy that gets to be there and, and put in the time developing somebody and, and watch the way that they go and engage, the difference between a successful coach and an unsuccessful coach, by and large, it's not always this way, but almost always, tends to be the people that have like a deep empathy for the people that they're dealing with and they're in it for the right reasons. And you can find these little kind of offside people that don't fit that but for the most part you're a good example of like understanding where people are coming from and I think after our conversation today I can understand a little bit more of why because you are not the typical you're not like me where it's like hey let's go exercise guys you're like I have deep anxiety about this so I'm willing to do it based on what it'll get me for my husband and my kids and my life but who <laughs> You're also a fantastic sport because I beat you in a bet back in the day and I got to run you through a workout and I made you do deadlift bicep curls, which she hated, by the way. She was miserable and I recorded it all and made her do preacher curl. Just We just did biceps any way I could get it. Squat biceps. Some videos of that. Yeah, it's on the Instagram. Check it out, Eric.berg. Instagram, scroll way down there, way down there. <laughs> Kaylee's doing deadlift bicep curls. Have you noticed how many of the stories of Kaylee end up coming back to us doing almost everything we can to like <laughs> make her laugh slash be right on the border of ruining her day? <laughs> I think that almost did it. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's all I've got for, for today, huh? Unless I'm missing something. Well, I'm going to keep going for an extra half hour on the okay. daily. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I love Jordan Peterson. Uh, me too. It's just uh, I'm not at that level. It's funny to feign that I am. Um, thanks very much for being here. Uh, having these honest conversations is really cool because I think that the more different experiences that we can talk about and the way that people have approached fitness and their experiences and what's worked and and where they've come out can really be an impactful thing for the people that are out there listening watching and, and things like this so it's like hey everyone come time. train with the trainer that doesn't like training herself <laughs> come <laughs> train with the trainer who doesn't like to train that's more relatable <laughs> That's more relatable to most people. Some people don't want to train with the superhero. I also have superhero. anxiety being here. Yeah, we some, can be anxious together. <laughs> some people don't want to train with the superhero because they can't relate to them. Hey, do you like sports? Me neither. High five. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like none of my clients have thought I was intimidating, but most of my staff do, which is kind of... I can vouch for that. <laughs> you used to come to my club and people were like, whoa, she's intense. You have, you have a little bit of RBF, but once you get through that veneer, then you can start cracking you jokes about You told me I had to swass. be nicer to new people. Kaylee, you have to be nicer to the new people. They're all scared of you. <laughs> Listen, you take a second to warm up, and once people break through that veneer of RBF, then they realize that there's somebody in there that one, once upon a time had the strength of a banana peel. <laughs> Just wasn't used to the entitled generation. I was like, you mean, you mean, like, I'm paying you to do this. Now I have to encourage you and reward you and pat you on the back for doing you your job? You did what you were supposed to oh do. Good goodness. job. So she's Good a boomer. Job. Yeah. <laughs> Boomer. boomer. That's an insult nowadays. Anyways, Not a boomer. wrap it up there. <laughs> yes. 
For those of you that are still here, feel free to comment down below on the things that you thought were the funniest or the most heartless stories that were told today, because <laughs> I feel like I've really taken a brunt of things that made me sound worse than I was. She, she's in great shape. She's been a successful in the fitness industry. And you're she, a superhuman, man. We appreciate yeah. you. Thank you. And you're not a bad coach. I wouldn't keep paying you. It was 2009. That's stay, like 14 years. Yeah, that's true. It's my Putting longest my relationship. Kids college. Don't tell my husband. <laughs> All right. Thanks for watching. <laughs> Leave a like, subscribe. Catch you later. Thanks for joining us this week. We appreciate your support. If you enjoyed this episode, we'd love it if you would subscribe, follow, and throw us a like on YouTube, Spotify, or Apple Podcasts.